Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation on autism and the astrology of autism, if there is such a thing. And my name is Gary O'Toole. I am over at TimelineAstrology.com. You can also find me at Patreon.com forward slash Timeline Astrology. And I have a particular interest in autism. I have myself identified with many of the traits of autism, though I have not had a diagnosis. I am an adult. I'm 50 years old this year. And although many adults are receiving adult diagnosis, um, many don't because either their parents aren't alive or whatever, for whatever reason, um, it's, it's very much a, a more involved diagnosis and a lengthy process, which I haven't undertaken. But I do identify with many of the traits and um, I'm going to show you that and why. Um, and it's a, a multifaceted, very nuanced thing, autism. It's not like you can see a particular signature in an astrology chart. And there's not just one signature. There's, there are many things, but there are a few things you have to obviously take into account based on the fact that it is as a social um, and communicative issue. Um, and autism as well, as well, meaning auto, Greek meaning self, uh, we can obviously explore that in the astrology chart. But I would wager that there are a lot of people who are astrologers, who study astrology, that have these autistic traits, maybe even are autistic. And um, it's because of how involved astrology is. It's a, an obsessive subject for people who follow it, myself included. And it gives us our, you know, sense of, you know, pattern seeking, which is a big thing for autism. And it also helps us understand the nuances of how we interact with the world. And it makes us so self-directed also many times, like autistic in that sense of the word. So um, anyway, let's jump into it. Um, before we get into the actual astrology, just a bit about the terminology. Um, autism spectrum disorder, that's the current phrase used in the medical uh, field. We used to have Asperger syndrome. Now they don't use that anymore. They use high functioning autistic. I think some people might find that offensive because if you're saying someone's high functioning, then someone else is not. Um, do we say autistic person or a person with autism? These are some things you don't, you know, who knows? Neurodivergent versus neurotypical. There's this whole thing about whether, you know, you are or you aren't autistic. And if you are, well, you know, you're just one person with autism and you're different to every other person with autism. You know, there's a saying that I've heard um, thrown around a lot where if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. There is just no uh, sense of that you can really define everyone in the same way. However, again, like I said, there are obviously some cues, right? Um, everyone has their unique thing, though. So you either are or you aren't. And so you either are neurodivergent or you're not. You're neurotypical. Um, here is the current medical um, terminology from the DSM-5. So persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. So it's a communicative and social um, thing. Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. So, you know, when you think about astrology and how and what it does for us and anyone who might be autistic or identify with some of the traits in that it is very much about being very, uh, one of the key things about autism is being highly sensitive. Um, and so that's actually a strength for somebody who is an astrologer because it makes you really tune into the planets as it were. And so you're communicating on that subtle level with the planets, but it makes all other kinds of communications in a very busy kind of, um, crowded area, really intense. And it's, it's quite overwhelming actually. So social interaction becomes really overwhelming when you're sensitizing yourself all the time through meditation and tuning into the astrology. Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior and interest. That's astrology. If you ever meet astrologers like myself, you'll notice that that's all we talk about. You know, we're obsessed about it. So anyway, I'm just highlighting some similarities, though somebody who has a lot of these traits might not be autistic. So that's why I'm saying, I don't know if I'm autistic. I have some of the traits. 
I identify with and many more than, than, than that, you know, so there's a reason why I believe that I, you know, um, could be autistic, um, but I might not be based on the fact that I have a lot of traits. That doesn't mean I am. So one thing to say here is that if you think there is just one astrology signature for autism, you either don't understand autism or you don't understand astrology or both. It's just a multifaceted, really nuanced thing. So this image, I don't even know if this is a real image. Uh, I got it off Twitter. Apparently, it's a pilot named Lloyd J. Ferraro. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if this is even possible, but it's just fascinating if it were, uh, this rainbow effect, because people talk about autism and the spectrum. Um, you know, when we think about like the, the symbol of this as well, and this is a symbol that's tied into a lunar mansion contained within sidereal Aquarius. And I'm going to talk about a lot about Aquarius in this presentation because there's a big link with Aquarius and autism and the ruler of Aquarius, especially in modern times, that's Uranus. And in traditional India, that's Rahu, the North Node. Those have a big say in autism for sure. But the symbol for the lunar mansion in this sign is an empty circle, just like this. And it's kind of like if you're autistic, again, you either are or you aren't. But if you are and you're within the circle, there's a whole myriad of ways you could be autistic and it's unique to you. You're an individual, right? Um, so there's that notion. You either are in the circle or you're not, but it's like anything within that. So I mentioned Rahu, the north node of the moon. In modern times, Uranus is said to rule Aquarius. There are a lot of similarities between Rahu and Uranus. But I have not seen anyone, whether a Western astrologer or Vedic astrologer, mention Rahu as something to look at for autism. I really don't know why that is. It's almost like it's their blind spot. But it is the thing, I think, to look at. And I'm going to show you why that is. So, well, first of all, one of the reasons why that is, is because autism coming from Greek autos, meaning self, is that there's this unclear sense of self. And when there's any unclear boundaries, then there's also a need to tighten up those boundaries. So why would somebody need to become autistic or more internalized and focused on the self? Is that interactions can be too overwhelming. And Rahu is all of that. Rahu makes everything more intense. And the reason I'm sharing this with you personally is because I'm finishing my own cycle of Rahu, an 18-year-long cycle of Rahu, Rahu Dasha, it's called. And I have, throughout these 18 years, identified more and more and more with autistic traits, which I didn't before. So you go figure out you know, what's going on there. I mean, I could have been autistic when I was a child. You know, I was a very quiet child. I was very shy, very sensitive. Again, these are all my strengths in an astrology practice, but I was all of those things. But it's really since I started Rahu and, and really, really got into Rahu period and that influence on me that everything became more intense. And that can be intensely good, of course, but it means everything is just overwhelming. And so social interactions are overwhelming. Um, I've also become uh, very aware of, um, because Rahu in my chart is in the second whole sign. And so it's very much about food. So I had developed some food things, which is a very common autistic thing. Um, and also in terms of um, sensitivities to other sensory things like noise. Noise is one of the bigger ones for me. I cannot handle really any loud noise at all. Um, so like I'm saying, I've kind of developed these kind of autistic traits, though I might not be autistic. And it's all down to Rahu. So thanks. Thanks, Rahu. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that everybody is going to go through that experience. And there's a reason why I would more so because Rahu in my second sign, the whole sign. And that is when you see the houses that are more involved with autism, what, the second sign is certainly one of them, the second house. So again, autism, meaning autos, meaning self, this, you know, unclear sense of self and then need to experience self. And sometimes, you know, actually you could confuse autism with narcissism because it's like, obviously, they're really having to focus so intently on themselves and, and their routines and their patterns and self-soothing all the time because everything is just so intense. Um, right. So that's. Rahu. I'll get back to Rahu in, in in a short while. I just want to talk about a little bit about the history of this, of the word autism, even um, the diagnosis in more modern medical 
uh, literature. So you have the Swiss psychologist, uh, Eugen Bluhler, first used the word autism with reference to schizophrenics in 1911. So that's not how it's used now, of course. The word um, to describe the condition as it is known today originated in 1943, when psychiatrist Leo Kanner distinguished the disorder from schizophrenia. So that's a clear distinction we need to make. Then in more recent times, we can look to this lady here. Um, she was a Ukrainian uh, psychologist. So Grunya Shukareva, I think it's pronounced, um, categorized autism nearly two decades before Austrian doctors Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, where we get Asperger syndrome. So two decades before that. This is a great article to read if you are interested in this spectrumnews.org. Uh, it's by L L uh, Lena Zeldovich. Um, and it's how history forgot the woman who defined autism. So this is taken from that article. It's becoming clear that Kanner and Asperger may need to share credit for the discovery, quote unquote, of autism, and that the condition's history could be as complex as its biology. A few quotes from Grunya Shukareva. So flattened, this is her observing now children with these autistic traits. And again, in that context, you would have used, they would have used the word autistic as this kind of just observing the behavior, right? Uh, I guess it wasn't like we use the word today. Um, flattened affective life, lack of facial expressiveness and expressive movements, keeping apart from their peers, talking in stereotypic ways, like repetitive ways, strong interests pursued exclusively. So we can identify all of those. These, these are all common traits we can think about. Let's get into the astrology. How would that look in the astrology? Well, first of all, again, there are there's just no one signature for autism. There couldn't be because it's so nuanced and complex. But it is a social thing. So we have to look at the social planets and we have to look at the social signs, houses, all of that. Um, planet signs and houses to look at, of course, all of them. So let's... I'm I'm drawing as well on what I've seen a lot. I've so I've I've scoured the internet of all the articles that I've come across and all the presentations I could find and see what's being said by other astrologers. And although I've seen some similarities in what everyone's saying, so there's a few things, but I have not, I'm so surprised, I have not come across at all Rahu. And that's my proposition here and theory, really. Everything's a theory. Um, is that Rahu is actually one of the key drivers here. So anyway, let's start though with Pluto. Pluto, because everything is hidden with Pluto, um, and it's, you know, the modern day ruler of Scorpio. So it's that kind of really intense inner world, you might say. Neptune, because it makes things unclear. And I've certainly seen this in charts in terms of, and I have it in my own chart, I have Neptune rising in my birth chart. It just makes it very unclear as to who's, what is the self, who is the self. And that can be very profound in terms of spiritual experiences um but it's not very practical when you're dealing with people in social interactions i i make it my superpower you know when i do readings for people because it basically means i can really tune into the person but that's not a great thing to have when you're in a crowded room for example uh uranus because uranus is the modern day ruler of um aquarius makes someone quote unquote unusual and so anything unusual and Basically, all of these three, Pluto, Neptune, and Uranus, can be lumped into, and what many Indian astrologers do, lump them into Rahu and Ketu, the north and south nodes. Pluto, more so with Ketu, because Pluto rules Scorpio in modern times. Ketu rules Scorpio in traditional Indian astrology. Uranus rules Aquarius. Rahu rules Aquarius. So you can see those um, correlations there. Neptune, on the other hand, you could say for both because Neptune makes everything unclear and Rahu and Ketu both are unclear. They're eclipses. So I would say Rahu, Ketu for all of the above. Saturn, because, you know, restricted, any kind of restricted anything or other, uh, whether it's a restricted social life, whether it's anxiety around dealing with other people, restricted speech, restricted anything, basically restricted diet, uh, whatever it is that that individual has who has been diagnosed with autism, we're, we, we're likely to see a Saturn thing. Saturn is the co-ruler of Aquarius, along with Rahu, and in modern times, Uranus. So it's the, it's the traditional ruler. So we can see that clearly. Um, and actually, one 
uh, or two, I think maybe more uh, astrologers and articles I read were bringing Saturn in and especially a square with Saturn Pluto. That was one, which again, I have, I have an exact square of Saturn Pluto in my birth chart. But again, I'm not saying I'm autistic. I'm just saying I have all of these signatures that an autistic person might have. Mercury communication for obvious reasons, Mercury, right? Moon because of feelings. I mean, it's how do you feel? It's like if it's a social issue, like social anxiety, um, retrograde planets. I have seen this in one presentation I'll, I'll show you, but I haven't seen it across the board, which I'm surprised by, because I mean, obviously it's a very sort of retrograde kind of thing. It's a very internalized kind of thing. Um, there's a very intense internal world that goes on with autism. Um, the houses you could look at, I mean, you could look again, you have to look at all of them because all houses, all signs interact with all other houses and signs. But you could certainly focus on the self itself, you know, the first house. Uh, you must obviously look at the second house of communication and the third house of interaction leading on from that. Um, you have to obviously look at the seventh house of relationships. But I haven't seen a lot of astrologers focus on the 11th house for some reason. And of course, the 11th house is the other social house. I mean, is social life. So 11th house for sure, 12th house because it's the hidden life also. But then you could also bring in, I didn't put it here, but the eighth house. Again, hidden life. The signs, all of them again, but like say Taurus, you know, in terms of sensory and all of that, the community, family, Gemini and communication, Virgo, because it's Mercury's other sign, Libra, obviously relations, Scorpio, hidden, Aquarius, social life, all of that. You can, you need to look at all of it, obviously. This is one astrologer I came across who I think is, this is a, a video worth watching if you're interested in astrology and or autism. Because she is, first of all, autistic and she's an astrologer. So she has a keen insight. And this is a, an amazing video and great explanation by this astrologer, uh, Shane Emily. So how I use astrology to help and cope with autism. I'd really highly recommend you watch this. Um, I'd wager that there are, this is my own, um, text here, I'd wager there are a disproportionate amount of people on the spectrum, quote unquote, who study astrology. I mentioned that before. Astrology might may actually even delay a diagnosis. So in my example, for example, I mean, it would be great yeah, if I had a diagnosis and I can have a catch all phrase of, you know, I'm on, you know, the high functioning autistic or whatever or Asperger's. That would be great in one way, because then people would understand what that means instead of telling them, well, actually, you know, no, I've got Neptune rising in my Scorpio ascendant and I've got Rahu, the North Node in my second house and I've got Jupiter in my third house and it's ruler Saturn in my eighth house, Gemini and Mercury is in the 12th house and so on and so on and so on. And it's like you have to explain every single nuanced thing in your chart for someone to get you. And in a way, it's easier to have a catch all phrase like autism in that case in my case, perhaps, um, to explain that. And so other people understand that. But the problem with that and the downside of that is that if I say if I say that I am, then people will make too many assumptions about what that means because it's individual. This is the key thing. But anyway, I would highly recommend listening to the, her, um, Shina, um, Emily. Um, just throwing in some astrology here. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit with different things just to hopefully keep your focus and interest in this. Uh, recent and future transits that I think might impact this whole issue, whether it's diagnosis, we're seeing more and more people being diagnosed, or and or whether there are actually more people with autism. And, you know, who knows? Uh, I don't think anyone knows that. So recent transits, we see, you know, Uranus was transiting through sidereal. I use the sidereal zodiac, by the way. Um Uranus was in sidereal Aquarius from April 2001 till April 2009. Again, I'm, I'm looking at Aquarius, especially here. Uh, Neptune was there also until recently, very recently, February, up until February 2023. And so there's an overlap there in 2009. There was actually a, a lot that happened in terms of in the UK, at least in 2009, in terms of autism, in terms of regulation and such and and and. Um, there was a bill that was passed, I think, in 2009. That was an important bill for autistic people. Um, Pluto will transit there from 
2039 to 2063, that's in the future. I'm wondering, you know, if we see, you know, and this whole thing of moving into the age of Aquarius as well, you know, let's face it. I didn't put a slide here that, you know, mentions the age of Aquarius, but I really do think that that is one of the main things to look at. The age of Aquarius basically is really, I think, the age of autism. Now, and I don't mean it in terms of a, a medical diagnosis. I mean it in terms of an age of distraction and a need to more and more and more become more um, internal, to focus more on the self. And it looks like narcissism, and it, you might describe it as such, but really it's a need because of the external distractions that are going to multiply and multiply. It's an age of technology. It's an age of being hooked up to the internet in every which way and wearables and maybe, you know, who knows how technology is going to take off in the age of Aquarius. But basically when that happens, it just robs us of our attention and it it just requires this kind of more autistic direction in a way. And you could say the whole thing about neurodivergence and all of that and different ways of thinking and different ways of being in the world, but we're going to have to adapt, obviously, to this new tech era. And so Aquarius is, is a big driver of this, I believe, whether, again, there are more people with actual diagnosis of autism or we're just seeing more and more autistic traits. And we're going to see more and more, I believe. So here are some hypotheses by other astrologers online that I, you know, just plucked from the internet um some of which you know you can see kind of some patterns here we're all pattern seekers of course in astrology um but again that the one that's missing is rahu which i'm really surprised by and this is actually what surprised me a lot because this particular website askastrologer.com um is seemingly a vedic an indian and a western astrology website and they in this analysis of this autistic person they use the tropical zodiac they use a south indian chart first of all and then they use the tropical zodiac but then they drop rahu and ketu the nose of the moon and if and i'm going to show you this in the next slide you put them in and you put in the sidereal zodiac and hey presto you have a clear indication of autism where this chart doesn't have that as much but here they have a hypothesis that, you know, that's the ascendant and the first house that is afflicted, quote unquote, by Uranus or Neptune. Like I said, I've got Neptune rising. I don't I wouldn't call it an affliction by Uranus or Neptune by any means. I, I wouldn't use that word. Um, like I said, it could be your superpower. But, you know, it's, I guess, for some people, an affliction. I don't know. Mercury and Mars afflicted by Uranus or Neptune. These are just, again, hypotheses that they have brought up here. Just in case you want to look it up yourself, the case study is a boy born on the 10th of November, 2004 at 2228, that's PM in Irvine, California. So um, let me just, I'm going to skip this because let me show you the actual chart in the Vedic. Here we have the same South Indian style chart and we have the sidereal zodiac and I've put in the nodes of the moon, Rahu and Ketu, and you'll see it straight away because... The Lord of this chart, rising sign Cancer, is the moon. The moon is exactly conjunct Ketu. So obviously Rahu is ex exactly opposite. So it's exactly conjunct the nodes. And they, for some reason, drop that in their analysis. Um, but I've seen this over and over again. I don't know why people are not looking at the nodes. Um, Saturn, you can see in the first house, the seventh Lord. Neptune in the seventh house. The third house has Jupiter and Venus. Venus is said to be in debilitation in Virgo. Um, so there's a few things you can see here for sure. There's definitely a few things you can see here for sure. The third Lord itself, Mercury, again, third house, because it's about uh, interacting and communicating and all of that is with Pluto in Scorpio. The second house of speech, Lord, the sun is debilitated in Libra with the nodes. You know, it's just one thing after another in this chart. And it's just clearer, I think, in that particular chart. Pardon me, I've skipped something. Uh, let's go back. So, yeah, that's one. Just that's just one case study. I grabbed this Reddit post um, and this person who was asking these questions about, you know, high functioning autism and astrology. Has anyone ever looked into this? I have a quite a few charts. High functioning autism runs in my family, so this is a person who identifies or who is being diagnosed with autism, and they're seeing some things like stellium. Um, planets in either Scorpio, the eighth house, or both Saturn in the first. We just saw that in that particular example, just one example. Um, 
usually conjunct the ascendant in this case. That's not something I've seen over and over. Um, then they mention moon in Capricorn or Scorpio. And here they've written, I found in general the moon in Capricorn types to have more issues with empathy than the moon in Scorpio types. Now, this is, we have to be really careful here because I've quoted here issues with empathy. What does that mean? Now, this is a misunderstanding, I think, about autism because why why this kind of predominant sort of um notion that autistic people are not empathic i don't i can understand where it comes from but it's actually untrue it's not true at all in actual fact autistic people are even more empathic you might say right because they're more sensitive they're highly sensitive and so that's why they need to withdraw they just can't handle um relationships sometimes and they need to pull back so they're not you know, they are absolutely empathic um, or can be, you know, because again, it's so individual that you can't just make that blanket statement that they're they're not empathic, which I just see over and over and people thinking that, which is actually one of the reasons why I would not want to state that I am autistic, you know, point blank. I am the most empathic person. It's just it's too intense. And I use that again, like as a superpower in terms of astrology because i can really tune into someone in doing a reading but after doing a reading for an hour and a half with someone i'm like it's too much and i have to go away and i have to kind of bury my head for a while so i have these kinds of extremes of experiences of intensely dealing with someone doing a reading and like really focusing in on them and then having to pull back and and not deal with anyone for a while few more articles I would recommend. This one by, there's a couple here by Lynn Hayes, an astrologer, who I think has good insights. Um, autism, the Astrological Connection and Musings on Autism and Astrology 2019 edition. These two articles, one leading from the other, I do think are, you know, very insightful. Um, another couple, you have one by Ray Robertson, holding a, a lighted candle. This is a different angle. The Pluto in Sagittarius generation makes its mark on autism research. That's a different angle. Another one, The Message in Autism, Five Autistic Children by Sandra um, Wiedner. This is a good uh, hypothesis, I think. I have it in my chart, but I can't just say that, okay, that's the case every time. Uh, the Saturn-Pluto hypothesis, that is a square um, or any kind of connections, I guess, between Saturn and Pluto. And you can see that kind of restricted Saturn, you know, hidden Pluto kind of world that, you know, we can we can examine. Uh, but it's just one thing of many things you have to look at, of course. And this is why I'd also recommend you um, purchasing. It's I think it's just five pounds um, to download this from the Astrological Association website. This is from a conference in 2021. I was actually speaking at this conference. I didn't get to see her live. Um, this is by Susan uh, Leon, uh, Leon, Leonti. And um, the Astrology of Autism was a really great presentation. I did purchase afterwards and I, I've watched it a couple of times. Um, and it's, yeah, it definitely goes into a lot here. And um, she studied, actually, I'll give you some uh, things that she said here. She studied 100 different autistic charts or those who have been diagnosed uh, with autism. Um, maybe not diagnosed all the time, but certainly identifying as autistic. And she herself identifies as autistic. So here are the things that she um, pulled out from that study. Uh, strong charts with the effective planets. Uranus featuring heavily. Again, Uranus is coming up again and again. Again, she doesn't bring in the North Node Rahu. Uh, unbalanced charts, buckets, fans, clusters, planets in one hemisphere or quadrant. Mercury, Venus, Mars, retrograde. She does mention the retrogrades. Um, planets at certain degrees, planets out of bounds, mutual receptions, looping disposition chains. That's an interesting one. Uh, single final dispositors, Mercury, Venus, Mars aspects, tight aspects, oppositions and squares and fixed signs. She has this big thing on fixed fixity in the chart and fixed squares and signs. Quincunx aspects, Saturn or Jupiter and air signs, Saturn, Pluto aspects again is coming up again and again. So highly recommend that one. Just a few examples I have myself, um, and these are just a few, and this just because they're well-known people, and I'm only using them for that reason. They're famous people, and you know, in one case maybe they are they are diagnosed. One case is a hypothesis. You know, this is 
um, a more obvious one to choose because he's a very famous person, Sir Anthony Hopkins. He was diagnosed in his 70s. So you can get diagnosed later in life for sure. But he obviously is a high functioning autistic. That is the current phrase, or it might have been Asperger's in, in years gone by. But here's a quote. I don't believe in it, he says. They call it neurodiversity. It's a fancy label. I'm very focused in one way. I notice when I'm in restaurants, but that's my behavior. So he obviously is on a high functioning spectrum because it's not affecting him badly. He doesn't believe in it. Now, there's a question mark here around his chart, because obviously you can see here that the ascendant here is the last degree of Sagittarius, sidereal Sagittarius. So it would be tropical cancer or Capricorn. The thing is, he's got an A rated time of birth. It could be that he was born a bit later. Um, at any rate, you know, because I do think looking at this chart, you can make arguments either or. Right. But I do think if you have Capricorn rising here with Jupiter, that would explain a lot about, you know, any kind of autistic traits here. Jupiter and Capricorn, you know, itself, maybe looking at it in the second sign with Aquarius itself in the third sign, looking at it here, you know, yeah, you could see all of that. The third then Lord of Aquarius, which is Rahu, remember, as well in traditional Indian astrology is in the 12th house. So you can see some things for sure here. And the seventh Lord Mercury is retrograde in the first house. So there's definitely some things, right? But it's not like overly, you know, overwhelmingly sort of screaming it. But again, he's he doesn't even believe in it. Here's one. Um, Einstein. So Albert Einstein, this is just according to this autism expert, Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge University. So he believes that he had this signs of Asperger syndrome, as it was known at the time. Um, this is more clear. I think that you could say there's definitely some uh, social issues here. Gemini's rising and its Lord Mercury is in Pisces, where it's said to be debilitated. Um, the second house has the nodes, um, south node Ketu. The second house, Lord, second whole sign, I'm using whole signs, by the way, is a cancer in the moon and it's in Scorpio in debilitation. The third house has Uranus. Um, and then again, I haven't seen astrologers note this a lot, but I'd have seen it in charts um, where the 11th house plays a big role. It's about social life and he has Neptune in the 11th house, Pluto in the 12th house. So you can definitely see, I'm not going into these in depth, obviously, but you can see some signatures here. Next one, Daryl Hannah, diagnosed as a child. She says she experienced a debilitating shyness as a child and fear of fame as an adult. Um, Again, there's not so clear and obvious signature here, but you can definitely say that this person is a sensitive person. She has Taurus rising, moon in Taurus. Second house has got a retrograde Mars, uh, Mercury, which rules the second house, is in the seventh house, Scorpio. Now, the fact that it's Scorpio is one thing, and the fact that Mars is in Gemini, there's an exchange between the second and seventh, you know, so there's that. Uh, but, and that can make that very more internal. But in Indian astrology, there's this key marker here of planets in certain houses that don't function as well. And Mercury in the seventh is one of those. Third house, Cancer is the moon sign which is in a rising sign. Uh, the seventh house, like I said, Scorpio. And um, the 11th house and uh, Jupiter's rulership of the 11th house. Neptune in modern astrology, of course, the 11th Lord of Pisces uh, could be thing you could look at. But you can see here Jupiter as well as her Lord Venus and Saturn. They're all in the eighth house. It's kind of, again, that hidden world, you might say. Uh, so you can definitely see some things there. Then finally... American scientist uh, Temple Grandin, uh, she is probably one of the more famous autistic individuals. She um, was non-vocal, I think, until she was six, I believe. Um, she thinks in colors or pictures, I believe she says. Um, and she obviously is, you know, in other ways, a great thinker because she's created systems to counter stress in animals and farms and in people. She's written a book. I'll show you what that book is in a while. You can see here Scorpio rising with the south node, with north node in the seventh house. Second house, Sagittarius, it's Lord Jupiter is in the twelfth house. Um, third house, you have the moon, it's Lord Saturn is with Pluto, opposite in Cancer. You can see some signatures here for sure. Her Lord is one Lord of Scorpio, 
again, Pluto in modern times, but in ancient India or traditional Indian astrology, it's Ketu. So Ketu rules this, but so does Mars. And Mars is in Gemini in the eighth house and with Uranus. So you can definitely see a few things here for sure. So that's um, Temple Grandin. So she has a book, The Autistic Brain. That's, you know, one if you were interested in reading. Um, another book, Simon Baron Cohen, I mentioned from Cambridge, he um, has this book called The Par Pattern Seekers. I think that's definitely worth a read. Another book, Unmasking Autism, and that whole thing about masking as well. Again, I'm just so surprised that Rahu hasn't come up in anyone's analysis because Rahu is the mask. And masking is the thing that you could say all autistic people have in common because you know, it's this social thing and it's sense of self and not clear around that and, you know, needing to really focus on the self. But what is the self when you start actually delving into it? You know, it becomes a bit elusive. And this is not, not a lot of clarity around the self, all of that. But masking is what people do. And apparently women do it more. Girls do it more. Autistic girls more than boys. And it's something to do with a, a socializing of young girls more so. That is a phenomenon, apparently. But I think all people do it, girls and boys. I certainly identify with this. And this thing of masking is basically just, well, we all do it. Let's face it. You don't have to be autistic to mask. Everybody masks in a so social situation. You're going to put on a mask and pretend to be something you're not. You're going to mask and be social. You're going to be wearing a mask. Let's face it. Everyone does it. But it's just that with autistic people, they're doing it so much and they might not even know they're doing it. And that's an issue because then they have these meltdowns where, and that, that's the term, terminology that's used, like you have a meltdown where it's just, you can't keep up the pretense anymore and you have to go and hide, you know? Um, but people who are high functioning autistic, as they're called, can function really well in social settings and actually can be very social. And the thing is, it's exhausting though, if you're masking all the time. And so Rahu is a key indicator of that, of that masking. Uh, another book is, I'm not sure, you know, but I haven't read this book, actually, The Myth of Autism, How a Misunderstood Epidemic is just Destroying Our Children. I'm not sure about this because it's the hypothesis here is that it's a medical condition and actually in, even a virus in the brain. Um, now, we could draw some correlations there with Rahu because Rahu Ketu uh, rule viruses, things that are infants, you know, really tiny that get in that you can't see everything about Rahu and Ketu is unseen um, and so it could be this hidden epidemic you know I don't know but again it's just a hypothesis I would say and not to take everything at face value and to study these for yourself because it's a it's an ongoing thing right so anyway I got finally one thing to share with you I've got my own plug and my own book that is coming out this summer 2023 I've written a book about my whole experience in this 18 year long cycle of Rahu. It's called Rahu Dasha. Dasha means literally Sanskrit to mean circumstance. So I've been in this Rahu circumstance for 18 years. Rahu is very prominent, therefore it has been for 18 years. It's in my second whole sign. And what has that meant? It meant that I've obviously, as an astrologer, go, gone into this as, uh, you know, with my eyes wide open or as much as I could. And I've learned a lot about Rahu and what it means. And I do see it correlating with a lot of autistic traits. And even if you don't identify with autism, it's helpful to understand what it is. If you are yourself going into a Rahu Dasha or you're within one, the intensity that it can bring, the kind of, you know, the power that it can bring in one way as well, but how to manage it. And so I call this a guide to thrive. I was originally going to call it a guide to survive, but you know, wait a minute. No, it's actually a guide to thrive because once you understand Rahu, you can actually make it work for you. And you just need to manage it though, because it's like, um, you know, a lot of the energies that Indian give Rahu is like a serpent energy, like a Kundalini, like a fierce energy that needs to be channeled in some way and needs to be managed. So I go through a lot about that and I have a lot of remedies that I've come across over the years in terms of how to manage Rahu, in terms of whether it's Indian traditional remedies or modern day remedies I've come across, lots of different techniques and people who, though they don't call anything they're doing Rahu orientated. Um, whatever meditations I've come across, like the Headless Way 
or whatever tools and practices around the shadow that I've come across that are helpful, I've put in. Um, and all of the other astrology, you know, having Rahu in each of the houses combined with the planets, conjunct planets, or each of the phases within the Rahu Dasha of 18 years, because it's a long time, you have to break it up into phases, subcycles. Um, one chapter I think is, you know, in terms of this subject anyway, is tomorrow's people today. Uh, this is something my teacher, Pearl Finn, my astrology teacher used to say of Rahu, tomorrow's people. And so I'm referring there to people who are neurodivergent in any way, whether it's autism or ADHD or ADD, whatever it is, just different ways of thinking and being in the world, because that's certainly what the Rahu period, Rahu Dasha uh, shows. So you can grab a copy when it's out. It isn't out yet. I'm um, releasing it this summer. 2023. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, because I know this has brought up a lot of different angles. It's a very nuanced thing. But if you want to share your own experiences or have any questions yourself, please feel free to post below. Uh, please like the video and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And if you want to get updated on this book, Rahu Dasha coming out this year. And thanks for listening. Until next time.